All right, so um, we're actually on now on week eight, if you can believe it. I'll go to modules and view to fix that front. Um, and our objectives for this week are to talk about photo editing, like iPhoto, Picasa, Photoshop, and Lightroom. Um, apply this learning to the creation of actual prints, and then talk about a very wonderful photographer, Hiroshi Sugimoto, which you probably have not heard of him. He's a little, probably not as known as some of our other photographers. Um, what what photo editing does anybody use here? Gitsu? Photoshop. Photoshop? Um, Mary? Yeah, I use Gip. Yeah, okay, so it's a lot like an old Photoshop, is that right? Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Yeah. I tried to install like the Mm -hmm. Is your is your computer a little bit older? Uh, no, it's not. But I think it might have virus or something, and then I have a friend who's coming. Yeah. Can save it. Yeah. No. Um, that so she brings up something that's useful. Since I, and one of the reasons why I wait till module eight to talk about this is that there is a one month trial of Photoshop or of Lightroom. And so I'll talk about the free services. I don't use GIMP, and so I haven't used that one. Um, it's another, it is another free service. Um, but I'll talk about some of the other services that you could use to make photographs. Um, but also I'll talk about the standards. We teach Lightroom and Photoshop because those are the professional programs. Those are the programs that um, we, you would use if you work in the field. And so that's the, the ones that we'll teach in the next classes that come up. Um, here. So we, um, we're going to talk about printing and sharing the photographic image, Sugimoto. Um, encouraging you this week to go to Flickr and spend more time on Flickr. You have your reading. Our discussion will be about printing and sharing and Hiroshi. And then the portfolio preparation. Um, we'll go over this in some detail today. It's a pretty important piece. It's a really large number of points. Um, I think it's, it's just a fact that this class is very heavily weighted towards the end of the class. So um, the portfolio is a lot of points, the paper is a lot of points, and so you still, good news is if you've been slacking, you still have time to uh, get a lot of points. Um, the bad news is don't stop now <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, um, if you've been working all along. Um, so we're going to look at the final, your final images and I'll give you feedback. And um, there's the tasks for this week. Okay, so let's look here. Um, so your book starts with workflow and goes on about printing and the image. And this is a really big leap. And as something I have mentioned before when we talk about backup, almost every article, and I read lots of them about backup, will say, you know, multiple hard drives, it will say, you know, cloud, it will have, you know, getting rid of viruses, whatever, things that you can do to your, your computer to make sure that you don't lose the digital files. But in the end, they come to the place where they say, the only sure thing is if you print it. That you need to print your images if you want to preserve them. And I think this is particularly true when you think about the changing in the computers. Um, if anyone here has ever used a floppy disk, probably not. Um, a floppy disk was, uh, they used to have these little plastic disks. They probably hold now about one document, but at the time they held huge numbers of materials. And now there's, you would have to go buy a historic computer to read one of those. I had a friend who wrote books and did all this journaling and, went, and he did it on a special floppy disk. When his computer died, he had to pay so much money for them to get his writing off of the, the, the storage units that he used. So it's really, really important to consider the fact that things are changing. Um, this computer doesn't have a, a CD player or DVD player. I have an attachment to do it. But think about that when that used to be the standard way to do to store images and backup images. So you really have to stay up and printing is one of the ways to do that. Um, so this is actually one of the pieces by Hiroshi Sugimoto, Sea of, um, of Buddhas. And we'll talk about him just, I would, and I was so moved, I'm so moved by his work for so many reasons. He has a lot about ideas, but also he had a show, when he had the show at the De Young Museum, walking in and seeing his prints, which are all very large, very well printed, really um, call you into the image, and he really thinks about the whole installation. And so he's going to be our inspiration for this week. Um, 
So I'm going to talk, take you through the process to get a print from a photo file. Um, there's very many variables in this. Um, Technology is always changing. There's, you know, this used to be better, now this is better. But there's a couple things you can know for sure. Um, and this is actually a raw dialog box is what you're seeing here. And I'm going to really, I obviously have recommended that you print in raw. Uh, or you shoot in raw. That you, you, if your camera will take a raw photograph, that is what I recommend you work in. Uh, yeah? Uh, I have all the raw files for my photos, but my Okay, you have a couple of options because the thing about raw files, it's like negatives. Later on, you can use it. Yeah, that's what uh, I'm saying. Yeah, so you have a couple of options. If you, what um, you can take the software from your camera. If your camera software can be installed in your computer, you have. You could take that software, and that software will have a way to take those raw files and output them either as TIFFs or as JPEGs, and that should be readable by your GIMP. Yeah, yeah, I have them in JPEGs as well. As well, so you work with the JPEGs. Yeah, I'm just worried about the size of it when I'm printing it. Can I still print it even if it's not JPEG? Yeah, um, well, as long if you did you shoot both in the camera? Yeah. JPEG, you, so you shot JPEG and RAW in the camera. If you shot a full-size RAW, a JPEG, excuse me, in the camera, you should be able to print it. If you're not sure, um, feel free to bring in some on a, a drive, and I'd be happy to meet with you and look at them. And, and if we have to take the raw files, there are computers on campus where you could bring your a hard drive with raw files, and we could translate them into something you could print. But likely, as long as you did large size JPEGs, those are printable. And this really brings up why raw, not JPEG. You can do great things with JPEG files. You can't make them quite as big, so you could make an 8x10, but maybe not a 20x24. You can, um, with a JPEG, in the camera, you're throwing away a lot of data. You're already telling the camera, okay, this is the color balance, this is the exposure, throw away the rest so that you can make a small file. In the raw file, everything is recorded. So what that means is when you go to process it, you have all of the material to make a great picture. Um, and if you change your mind, if you want to make an enlargement, it's all there. So rather than, than choosing at the moment when you photograph, you get to work with it in the computer and at that point decide what, what stays and what goes. So I think um, that's why I, I really recommend you consider going to RAW. Um, the pictures, the classes we have, either 4A, which is digital photography, and 72, which is Lightroom and Photographic Design, will incur, will have you be working with raw files. Um, the Photoshop class, these are both offered in summer. Um, Photoshop class is offered every quarter. The Lightroom and Photographic Design is usually offered every other quarter. So I would expect, I'm offering it in summer, it will offer it again in, in winter of 2016. Both are very useful classes for those of you that want to continue with your studies of photography. Okay. <coughs> And you can see here um, the photo department and examples of some of the work of people who have done these classes and some of our curriculum for those of you interested. All right, so the first step in getting a good print is monitor calibration. Just think about it, and I don't know if any of you have ever done it, but there are buttons, and you can make your, your computer lighter or darker just by pushing those buttons. If you make your computer lighter or darker, are you changing the picture? Not at all. The picture is still exactly the same zeros and ones and, and all the code that's been put in it. So if, you, if I made this computer really, really bright, I would think my picture was too bright and I might darken my picture. If I made it really, really dark, I might think the picture was too, too dark and I might lighten it. It's very, very important that you consider calibration. Um, so this is the calibrator for a Macintosh, and where you would find that is in the Apple, under System Preferences, under Displays, and then um, under Color. And you can see Calibrate right there. Because I have, right now I'm projecting as well as, as um, have the screen, I'm not going to run the calibrator live. Um, but you get this dialog and you just walk through it step by step. And when you walk through it, um, here's the instructions. There's a couple things I'll point out. This is also on the handout on Module 8. Um, okay. 
So you want to um, make sure it's been turned on for a half hour so it's as bright as it can be. You want to make sure it's consistent. Um, you want to make sure it's displaying thousands of colors or more or millions if possible. Um, this is something a lot of people don't think about. I actually always have all my backgrounds as gray. Um, if you have lots of colorful backgrounds when you're trying to do photo editing, that could shift your perception and make you choose the wrong color. So at least for your photo editing time, you should make your, your, um, your display a gray. Um, and then in a, Windows, there's Adobe Gamma Utility in the control panel. And in Mac, there's um, the color calibrator utility. Okay. And for best results, this is actually from Adobe. Use third-party software and measuring devices. Make sure that's right. Okay. Um, monitors do get worse over time. Um, you do need to watch it. When I, I use a laptop, the other problem, hard part with using, how many people here use laptops? Okay, so quite a few are using laptops. If you're using a laptop, notice next time you're sitting down at the laptop, just move it back and forward. And realize that depending on the angle of the laptop, you also will get different results. Um, there, you can sort of set a certain angle. So you calibrate at a certain angle. You make sure you're always sitting the same angle to, like, like you don't slouch. You always use the same angle to the computer. Um, but what I actually do is I take my laptop and I connect it to another higher quality screen. So when I'm going to do serious photo editing, um, I'll, I will do that. You might say, why, why bother? But when you start thinking, some of the photo papers that I print onto can be 4 or 5 or $10 a sheet. When you start talking about that kind of money on the photo paper, it becomes even more important that you get the right answer in the, in the computer. This is one of the... Um, third-party calibrators. It's called i1 Display Pro. Um, and this is if you're serious. i1 has it. Monaco is another company. They tend to cost $200 to $300 for these calibrators, um, which may seem like a lot of money. Um, but if you start thinking, and many people don't really consider how much inks cost and everything else costs. So like when you take the next level classes and you can use the Idea Lab to print, they charge you um, for an 8 by 10 print, I think it's up to $2.50 for the ink. You bring your own paper. And they, they are just trying to cover costs. They're not making a profit by their ink charges. So when you think about that, if you actually sat down and calculated how much it costs to run your printer, you would be very surprised at the cost per print. And so that makes it very important to get to have good results right from the beginning to make sure that your monitor is correct, that you're actually sending good data to your computer, to your monitor, to your, your printer, sorry. Um, so the example I have is I, I did this book, um, Searching for True North, it was my husband's photography. I was the, the editor and I did the editing. We did um, high reg scans on all the images. There was 130 images in the book and I did all of the post-processing on, on this book. So when I was going to do this book, I knew that we were sending it to be printed in China and we were going to get um, one sheet of proofs. So basically we got six pictures and we, I had to make the choices for 130 pictures based on those six pictures. And if I didn't do a good job, it would cost money or it would just be wrong in the book, which was really important not to be. Um, so when I set up to do this, I got, actually got a new monitor, an ISO monitor, which is a professional level monitor. I calibrated, I changed the lighting in my room, so the room, um, I put um, blackout curtains over the windows so that when I was working, the light wouldn't change. Because imagine if you're in a room where the morning light is one way and the afternoon light's another, that could affect what you do. Um, and so I really was important to um, make sure that I could, got good quality on this project. When um, we look at this, and I, we'll see what price it is right now, 204, it wasn't too far off. Um, this has a couple of interesting things that you'll see here. Um, first thing is ambient light measurement. That means that this particular calibrator actually reads the room light. So it is possible 
to hook it up so that it will change the screen as the room light changes. So if you're working in a place where you cannot control the room light or you need, need the daylight, you can use this to help. Um, you can also, you do the, you control the, the you measure the, the monitor and you set a profile. Let's, um, let's see, let's get back here and go here on the x right x right is a site that specializes in everything about color calibrations. And I'm going to play this, but I'm going to silence it. Okay, I do need a full screen. Okay, so I'll just let them, and they'll talk, 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 talk. We'll try to move forward. So you can see here's a professional level monitor that you're seeing there. And that, you know, this is an example like fashion where you really, really do need to get the right amount of, let me get to the right things. There. You, or maybe not. You really want the fashion to look like what the fabric looks like. You can't, you know, chance it. Maybe the green, the green tree could be a number of colors of green and we might all accept it. But using this little gadget, you can see how she puts it on there, and then the screen will play a series of colors. And that will allow, and it has a little electronic eye on it. And it reads those colors and creates a profile for your monitor or for your, your um, projector. And then um, they say it will also do it for projections. You have to pay extra for that, actually. They don't mention that here. And then it sits there, and it will read the room light, and it will allow you to make a whole profile that will work for um, for all of your outputs. Okay, and they have lots more things that they say it will do. There it is, color calibrating again. Okay, so if you want to watch this, I have a link to it um, in here, not required. Um, so that's something to consider as you think about how are you going to get your monitor to be good. How are you going to get the right color so you make good choices? The next thing is to think about which application you're going to use. Um, here is a gallery in iPhoto. iPhoto is actually being replaced by Apple. Um, and I don't actually have any photographs in this particular album. And so they do have both Photo Now and iPhoto. They're going here. So I'm going to um, just go to my desktop and my pictures. And drag these in. And so you can see um, the way that it, it makes a an album. I can take any pictures of somebody's picture. Is this someone's here's picture? I forget whose picture it is right now. Does it say? No, it's one picture I downloaded from um, Flickr to fix. And you can see in, in iPhoto, I have a limited number, and this is one of the reasons I think they're changing it, a limited number of, get out of a limited number of controls in this area. So I have a basic rotate where I can turn it. I can just do a sort of an enhance, which it's going to guess. And then I can undo everything at any point. Um, it will fix red eye. You can straighten it. It's pretty straight already. You could crop it, and you can do basic retouching. It also has this effects boxes. Very common. You'll see this when we look at other ones too, Picasso, um, where you can do some basic effects. I never found iPhoto particularly compelling, but it is on many Macintoshes still. Um, as I said, it's going to be replaced by something else. So here I can, but here in the adjust, I can get a little more elaborate um, controls.
And I can use the eyedropper like we did um, in the other ones. So I'll try to adjust it for your screen. Okay. So you can see very quickly I can, I can change it and there's a revert to original. Um, so you have some controls over it and then you can do different outputs. You can also share it directly to your Flickr account, to an email, and to other create things with it. So some people are very fond of iPhoto. Anyone here using iPhoto? So here's the quick fixes that I mentioned in the last when I was going through it. And this is an image that I put in there and did this to. And here is the more elaborate corrections. And you can see, and let's go back here because I think that's, um, this is going to be common as we go through these. What do we see? We see exposure, contrast, saturation, definition, highlight, shadows, sharpness, denoise, and a temperature and a tint. You'll see these in different orders. So temperature goes from blue to yellow, tint goes from pink to green. Um, and you'll see, but basically all of these controls are what you're going to see in all the programs we look at um, today, um, short of Photoshop. You can get them in Photoshop, but they're not directly available in Photoshop. Okay, and so here I have adjusted this picture, so if you go back you can see the picture's really changed. And I, it, con I had contrast, saturation, definition, darkened the highlights, and added a bit of sharpening. I can also do an iPhoto effect like black and white or sepia. Let's see, it doesn't, I think. Nope, I didn't need to. Okay. Oh, see flow or flicker. And here's the photo in directly in Flickr. That's been changed from what it was. And you can see the um, how much importance that was compared with the first version that I was able to improve it with a really a few short clicks. And I will come down here and I will share it to oh it's not me. Okay, it's it's can't share it. I'll go, I'll go back and share it later to the group. It's Annie's students' pictures. Alright, the next one is a free software called Picasa. I think someone said that they um, some of you have that. You can download Picasa here from um, the web. It is um, free and it has some very good features that um, you might be interested in. Let's open Picasa. Okay, and this is the first thing actually. So um, here in Picasa, it actually finds faces. And I find it pretty amazing. Um, when it's wrong, it's really wrong. But sometimes it's pretty amazing at what it can find. And then it gives you a chance to say, is this really Gare? Yes, it's really Gare. And you can go through and click them through. Um, and so it, it's going through the computer and finding people um, to see. And then you're able, it will do face recognition for you. And you can do little things with that. Some of the other, let me go back to the Picasso. And you can see it's brought in a lot of pictures when I clicked, click. Find a color picture, let's find a color picture. Okay. So we're going to choose a color picture in here. These have actually already been adjusted, but it doesn't matter. You can see the effects. Try to find something. Okay, so there's a color picture. Let's look up there. Um, and so I have, you can see in the adjusting, let me make this bigger. I have a crop, so it will allow me to do different crops. And it has some manual crops. It also has some preset crops. So if I knew I needed a 5x7, it would give me the options for a 5x7 automatically. It has a straighten. So if I wanted to straighten it, I could use this to straighten the image. A red eye. I'm feeling lucky. Um, I don't ever feel lucky. 
I never click the one click. I always want to control things. There's auto contrast, auto color. It might do something there, not much. Um, a retouch, you can add text to something. So you can type and add text. And you can do fill light, which would open shadows, as you can see. Okay. And so then you can also go to the next level, which is more fine tuning, fill light, highlight, shadows, and color temperature. Remember that. And again, we see our little eyedropper for a neutral um, dropper that we can neutralize something in the picture. Okay. We have some special effects here that it offers that comes with it, like a sepia or a soft focus, eek, bad news. Um, and then you have some more unexpected <coughs> effects, like duo tone, so you can actually um, change the colors between what colors there are. Cancel. You can do um, Holga. Who knows what a Holga is? Remember from the first one? Plastic camera. Plastic camera. So they actually give you a button to try to make it look like a bad plastic toy camera. Seems like a, an idea. Um, Lomish is another kind of weird plastic camera. Um, infrared film. Some of you know I actually shoot a lot of infrared film, so you can see how it makes that guess at what infrared film might do. And then here are some more um, special effects from making it look like a Polaroid, making it, giving it a border, and just different things. So it has some nice effects. And then from there, you can share it. Share it with your Google account. You can email it to someone. You could print it, or you could export it. So the changes are not happening to the picture. They're happening inside Picasso. And then they'll be applied when you change it. Let's just see that. Um, let me go back to a really wild and crazy effect. Hmm. And if I can find, so what is the name of this? This is two, here's the name, 2003959. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to look for 2012-USA-3959. Okay. And you can see, I don't know which one this is, but you can see that these have not gotten that effect on them, can, have they? Right? So the, the images in the computer have not been affected, only the image in, in uh, Picasso. And so then if I export it, I get to choose where to export it to and um, how I want to export it. You can see a lot of controls in here. So Picasso for a free program can be really quite nice. There's info. You can see info about it. You can see, um, you can add tags. You can do location if you wanted. Um, I don't know if this has GPS set in. It should, actually. Or you can add a person to it. OK. So that's a basic intro to Picasso. But you're starting to notice some things that are always the same. We have the eyedropper. We have something to do with contrast, something to do with lightening and darkening. We have something to do with highlights and shadows, and something to do with color, color, color tint. So this brings us to the next big question, Photoshop Elements or Photoshop CS. Um, and there's been a big move in Adobe to go to subscriptions. Um, there are some pluses to subscriptions or some minuses. Some people are very strongly feeling. Is anyone subscribing to the Adobe sub things? You are? It's okay. Um, which one do you subscribe to? Just Photoshop and Lightroom or? Well, at my job, I have everything so Okay. So you have the full. Okay. So you can do the full suite. As a student, you get quite a good price on Photoshop and Lightroom as a subscription. Um, and I don't, I don't, you know, I do use it. I also get it from my job. I get it from the school. So I don't, and I actually do also have a second, for my, uh, I, for my home computer, I have a, um, a subscription that is based on um, being an Adobe expert. And so I, I get a, a subscription on my home computer for that. Um, but when I like some of the things about it, I like that you can upload things to the cloud. I like that you can save things across computers. 
Um, you don't have to always be online to work on it. That's a big uh, misnomer about the Adobe, the Creative Cloud. You have to um, check in every, depending on how you've paid, month or three months onto the web to keep it active, just like a trial. Um, Adobe definitely feels like they, and they probably were right, people were using their software that hadn't paid for it. Um, imagine that. And so I think the subscription has been a way that they've really tried to push people into um, getting, getting their, their trial, getting their, their software, excuse me. Um, so here's the photographer's plan. It's $9.99 a month. You can get um, Lightroom and Photoshop for $9.99 a month. Um, and I think the student plan is probably the same. It's just that it's, um, it's not actually any cheaper. Now, you do have the option still to do standalone Lightroom. And what some people are doing who don't want to get into the cloud because they're no longer going to support standalone um, Photoshop. That's going away. But you can still get Photoshop Elements. So you could do a lot of the things you'd need to do between Lightroom and Elements if you wanted to buy software. But I think the Lightroom is now also kind of getting left behind. So there's going to be features in the Creative Cloud Lightroom that you cannot get in the um, standalone Lightroom. So, yeah. So there's no way to install this without going to install it via Creative Cloud anywhere? Um, you can go to the bookstore and you can get a standalone Lightroom. Because uh, that seems to be the thing that messes with my computer. And it's installed by Creative Cloud, but it then freezes. You can't do anything. It keeps saying, like, you need, you need to sign out of Creative Cloud. <coughs> and it doesn't matter how many times I redo it, it keeps saying no. You might want to take the Creative Cloud out, and, because you're, if you're not going to do the Creative Cloud, and then um, just install the, the Lightroom. That's what I'm and if you, and, But it, it wanted me to install it through the well, that's what it wants, but you, you, you have to, I think you, um, if you download, and this is what I would say, you now have a specialist. So this is, go on their site, and they, I found them, they can be quite helpful. Okay. They will, um, when you have questions, and, you know, ask them in the chat. But I would say, um, and this computer has it in, so I can't really do it. You should be able to um, do the free trial, yeah. and then use the license from the bookstore. To act to keep it active, and it shouldn't be through. I mean, they're going to try to get you to do it through Creative Cloud, um, and I, and it, I, I would not be surprised if there's not a point soon where they will not support anything but that. Um, but the same problem. I have a computer that's perfectly good, but it, I have to update its system before it can use the CC, Creative Cloud CC, and I had some strange things happen where. I did a file in an older InDesign, and when I try to bring it to the newer InDesign, when I try to open it in the, in the new InDesign, it says it was made in a newer InDesign, but it's not. It was made in an older InDesign. You know, so there's a lot of little things with the way that they're doing this that can be quite annoying. I will not, will not deny that. Um, so Photoshop is the full program for professionals. There are some things you can only do in Photoshop. Um, I will say that... Um, it's the professional tool. I encourage people to consider learning it. If you want to learn it here, they, they have it at the computers on the Idea Lab, and we also have it, in, or if you want to use it here and you didn't want to have to buy it, there's also, it's also on the computers in the Krauss Center for Innovation, the Apple computers that are in the fine art area. Um, so you can use, you could use Photoshop here um, fully. Lightroom you really need to have yourself one way or another if you're going to use it. It is probably right now my favorite program because of the way that it helps me organize. Um, when I go out to photograph, if I take that, you know, a few thousand photographs, that's not unusual. Well, if I take a few thousand photographs, what's Photoshop going to do with a few thousand photographs? It can't do anything with it. It takes one photograph at a time, as does a lot of these other programs. Um, Lightroom will really let me very powerfully work with my images. Um, Elements, I have actually worked a bit with Elements because I have, because um, that's what my dad prefers, and so I had to learn to how to do some things to help him. Um, it has a lot of the features of full Photoshop, uh, but not all of them. So you could do, you, for many of you, if you just needed more than Lightroom, you may find Lightroom and Elements a, an okay combination. And Elements is taught, is um, sold as a freestanding program. It is not part of the cloud.
And so you would um, just, let's see what, how much it is. It's usually, and I think you can get this at, on a student discount too, but you know, 60 or $70 um, for, for elements. And it, what, what it won't do is some of the more advanced color management things. Some of those you could still do through Lightroom. Some of them you simply couldn't do unless you had the full Photoshop. Um, but there's all, it will still do layers. It will do a lot of things that you might need. And then the next question is Lightroom, which I've already mentioned. It's a key tool for photographers. It's becoming the main way people do their editing. Um, it's very good for organizing. I have over 100,000 pictures in my Lightroom catalog, and that's in the more recent Lightrooms. They can definitely handle that and way more. And so when I work on images, I tend to work on organize them in Lightroom. And then if I have to do something in Photoshop, I do it through Lightroom. So I open it, I edit in Photoshop, and then come back to Lightroom. It's a really good way to organize things. Okay, so you can give flags, stars, let me open. I don't know what's going to open. Everything is cars. I don't want any more cars. Oh, my God. All right. Actually, here was the lighting thing that we did in class, and then here's the Hidden Villa. I'll use Hidden Villa as the example. So the first thing I might do when I go into Lightroom is I'm going to go through and just quickly look at things that might be interesting. I might want to make them a little bit bigger. Oh, actually bigger, not smaller. And so I'm going to go through and say, okay, do I like this one? Okay, I'll give it a two. Oh, I'll give it a th oh, cancel. I'll give it a three. <coughs> we'll go through quickly. We can see our hidden villa. There's the ear. I thought that was really interesting with the texture. Um, but bad pictures, bad pictures. There's going to be lots of bad pictures. Do this one with a three. And so you just go through and you choose the ones you think are interesting and give them a number. And once you have chosen a few, The sheep were really, really cute. And someone took a picture of me feeding the chickens. Okay, there, there are some of you. So you just go through and choose, give numbers to the ones you want. That's going to be it. And then I can go attribute and just take the ones that are two stars are above. And then I select them and I'll make a collection. Collections are really um, a good way to sort, sort things again. Two star plus. So now I have 15 pictures in this collection, and now I can look at them and think about what I want to do with them. So I'm going to work on the development module with this. First thing I think I want to do is crop and get rid of, because we couldn't get closer to the cows. And then I want to look, I look at the histogram and I decide uh, I can take my eyedropper if there's something neutral. I can use my vignette. 
a little darkness around the side. And then we can see before and before and after. Not much change on this one, but just a few things that I've done. Okay, let's go to the next one. Go to one I know. I picked one that was really had this problem with it. I don't know. This is a great. It's not a great picture. These are more fun, but um, this has a really really bright. So when we look at the controls, if we take the highlights down, and we see this may not be savable. It may not. Um, but we'll see what we can do to make it at least a little bit better. And we'll take the gradiated filter. Okay. And the order that we do it doesn't, I mean, it's, I tend to encourage people to go from top to bottom, but it doesn't really matter because Lightroom will apply it in the best possible way. That's one of the things Lightroom does. So there's the picture now. And there's the before and after. Not a picture that maybe can be totally saved. You know, it was just too great a contrast range, but it certainly is better in the new edition than it was in the old. And that's sort of um, what you want to look at as your tools and what you can do. So those are things you can do in Lightroom here. The other things you can do have to do with, um, you, can, you can map things. I'm going to go to all of my pictures. I'm sure some of them will show up on the, on the map. All photos. So um, I have a GPS on my camera, so you can add a picture to the map. But since I have this GPS, you can actually see where I took all of my photographs. And you can see the ones in China, Norway, across the United States, up into Canada. And so the, the GPS lets me do that. And I can also add. Um, I can add pictures to the GPS, and that's a really nice feature. Um, I can make a slideshow of my pictures, which will play, and I can do different um, different looks, and diff I can add music, I can make it a movie, or I can make it a PDF. I can print from here, and so I can print um, a contact sheet. Contact sheet, stay. So you can see, um, Yeah, that's okay. Um, I could make a contact sheet. There it is, so that you can see that the images are here. And I can print small ones. I can print even more small ones. I can do um, some custom, interesting effects with with paper. I can do multiple pictures in a single on a single page. Um, and then I can make a website. And the websites are pretty, they have some pretty interesting starting points for the websites in, in Lightroom. Some of them are not, not a good idea. Not a good idea. Don't do that. So this is library mode. That's where you'll do a lot of your sorting. And then you do develop mode, which I showed you, where you um, begin to work on the pictures. There's some links here um, that I recommend you look into. One is Why to Use Lightroom from Popular Photography, which is a, a good article talking about, after you re-skip the ad, um, talks about why, why we would use this and why they recommend it. And then a really a good article um, from Forbes magazine is what um, Photoshop Adobe Lightroom is professional photographers best friend and they talk about why so it's good to know um, and then if you're interested in learning some things about Photoshop or Lightroom or any of the Adobe products I really recommend Adobe TV um, they have an amazing array of videos that you can watch that will um, really expand your knowledge in in this field and they're all free, and they're done by some of the best people. Probably one of the best people is Juliana Cost. She's one of the greatest um, online, she's one of the great teachers, if you get to see her in person, but does very, very good online videos. 
and I highly recommend anything that she does. A couple other people, um, these are all by Juliana actually. Um, let's see, let me say highest rated. Um, Matt Kozlowski is another person who does really good videos that you'll find on the web. I don't think he's on Adobe TV right now. So here's a, a handout and a page that sort of talks about the things we've talked about. What are you going to fix? So I took this base picture and sort of made examples of exposure, light or dark, contrast, flat or contrasty. The highlight value, it's also called um, recovery, which brings in your highlights. So separate. So when we look, and it, it changed its name in, in Lightroom. Let's get back to develop in Lightroom. There we can see butterfly. And so you can see here we have highlight value and whites. And when I click on here, can you guys see that? That little gray area up in the histogram? That's the area I'm affecting. So that's one of the things I really like about Lightroom. So I'm, I'm a, you can never affect one thing. All tones are like slinkies. You move one part and the other part will move. It's all like wire up a spring that's connected. But when I click on highlights, you can see the gray area that that is activated. When I click on shadows, see that gray area over on the left hand side of the histogram. When I do whites, it's very, very, very far right. And when I do blacks, it's very, very far left. So you really have a graphical um, information about what you're most affecting. And as you move them, you can really see the change. And while the whole histogram will shift somewhat, it will mainly affect the piece of the spring that you grabbed. Same here. Hi some places will call it highlight values or recovery. Some will call it shadow or fill light. And we've seen all those in our different terms. Here's a few more controls from the Bodhi. Saturation from no saturation. I can do that here. Here's saturation, no saturation to total um, yicky overdone saturation. Um, temperature, so temperature we have from blue to yellow. <coughs> and then we have from green to pink. And so knowing these terms and starting to work with them, you can start to imagine the controls you have, Wilson. Do you ever do isolated adjustments in your own editing? Oh, yeah, often. Yeah, um, and I do it two ways. In, in Lightroom, so say that I really just wanted the butterfly to be colored. I can come down here to the hue, saturation, and luminance and do, go to saturation. And I say, okay, I only want the butterfly to have color. I can actually click here and then grab the green and just pull down that color. And then I'll, um, I don't want to pull down the yellow because that would pull down the, so you know, you can, and there's another green, I'll pull down that green a little bit. So now you can see how the, the butterfly is the only thing really colored. And I, then I could pick on, on the butterfly color and go up and saturate him. I mean, that's, that would be local. I, I mean, I can't say I use that, I could use that some, like if I had something distracting on the edge, I might yeah. pull the color out of it. The other way that I do, um, I'm gonna more for like, just like, you're right. So for exposure, I have two major tools in Lightroom. I can also show you in Photoshop. One um, control is this graduated filter. So if I click on that, and you see how I drag it, everything above it is affected. Everything in the middle is a transition, and everything below is not affected. It's totally masked. And so I can here I happen to have exposure. I can lighten or darken that area. I can also change the contrast. I can change the saturation and any of these controls in that with that tool. So that is the graduated filter. Then say that I just wanted to paint. So this is the adjustment brush. Same kind of control. I could um, I can get a brush size and I could just say, okay, I want the bottom of this picture to be darker. And I can paint right in that local area. And I do that all the time all the time. I'm, I'm you know, painting in different places. In Photoshop, um, let's edit this in Photoshop, just so you know. 
I use a lot of Photoshop also. Um, if I did it in Photoshop, again, I don't want to do anything destructive to the picture. I always want to be working in a way that's non-destructive. So in Photoshop, what I would do is I would do a adjustment layer of, say, curves. And say I wanted to make this darker. And I would say darken top. Quick for the, those guys that are following. I would darken the whole thing, but then I would grab the gradiated fil filter here. And then I could darken the top like that. And so I would do that through an um, adjustment layer with a mask. So you can use masking in Photoshop the same way. I don't ever, in Photoshop or Lightroom, work on the actual pixels. I'm always working above them. And that's one of the things you learn if you take more of the Lightroom and Photoshop classes, is how to do it in the best possible All way. Yeah. All masks, yeah. So whatever I did, I would do as a mask. Um, some, play, some people would recommend multiplying the background, but it makes your file much larger. So as long as you use adjustment layers and layers above the base background, you won't change the background and therefore you're not doing any damage to the file. Okay, okay this is actually a little movie that you can watch. Um, that should go, well maybe, I think it's worth. I'll, I'll let you guys watch it if you want. I basically did what I did for you guys with the, with the butterfly and stuff, only in detail. This was a picture, an older picture from Hidden Villa. Um, and it goes through all of the steps of adjusting it from beginning to end. And you can see it. I recommend watching it. Okay, printed. File with no adjustments, printed with adjustments. Um, we have 11 o'clock. Let's, um, let's stop now. We'll take a 10 minute break. I'm going to bring in some samples that you can see. And we're going to talk more about um, Photoshop and Lightroom and adjusting and printing. Thank you so much. See you in 10.